We are in 1 Samuel, the 17th chapter. We're going to look at what is one of the most well-known stories in the entire Old Testament. And it's the story of when David the shepherd boy has an epic battle to the death with a giant by the name of Goliath. And uh, so we're in 1 Samuel, the 17th chapter. I'm not going to read the entire chapter. It would take a while for us to get through. We're going to pick up the story in verse 32. So David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, uh, we, uh, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it struck it, rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on, uh, on his sword over his tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I am not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand he chose five smooth stones from the stream. He put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag and with his sling in his hand approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistines with his shield bearer, uh, let me, did I miss something? No. Meanwhile, the Philistine with his shield bearer in front of him kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. And he said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. So trash talking is nothing new. <laughs> David said to the Philistine, by the way, David dishes it out just as well as he takes it. He says, you come against me with a sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel, and all those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. <laughs> what a great story. <laughs> Don't you just love it? I mean, first of all, we're Americans, so we're automatic. We automatically love the underdog in any fight. We just love that. And uh, this is actually not a story about underdogs win. This is not a story about you never being afraid. This story is incredibly complicated and rich in meaning. And we're gonna discover that it reveals some things to us that might surprise us. This story starts with a lot of tension. If you've ever been in a room where there's a lot of tension, you know what that feels like. This is escalated. There are men on both sides that are preparing for battle. They're gripping their shields, their swords, and their spears. And the entire valley of Elah has been like a cauldron where fear and arrogance have been brewing, and now it has reached a boiling point. This has been going on for weeks. We're actually at day 40 of Goliath's intimidation of the entire Israeli army. 
and uh, there's one person that seems to not be aware of how much tension is going on. It's, it's David, the shepherd boy. He's a young man, not considered old enough to be a warrior, and he's either bowing down or kneeling to pick up some stones out of the stream that is running through the middle of the valley. He picks five of them. On either side of this valley, there are two outstanding figures. One is Goliath, who's called a giant. And I know that there are some people who go, see, that's what I have trouble with about the Bible. It says there are giants. Uh, by the way, giants are nothing new in the world. And by the way, they're not gone either. In fact, a French giant just recently passed away, known in wrestling. Does anybody know his name? <laughs> Andre the Giant. That's right, about seven and a half feet tall. By the way, a number of NBA players have exceeded seven feet in height. Uh, the tallest people who they have record of, of all, uh, they, they've exceeded eight feet in height. The tallest person there was ever recorded record of who died in 1940, interestingly enough, of infection. They, they didn't have the, the um, antibiotic options that we have today. And uh, he was 22 years old. He never stopped growing from the day that he was born. And by the time that he died, he's on record at having died at 8 feet, 11 and a half inches. What car do you put him in? Like, <laughs> how does that work? You know, you can't even get a horse for him to ride. Like, <laughs> nothing, nothing works about that. So there's this giant, and uh, his name is Goliath. And, uh, you know, the... the trying to figure out the measurements from Old Testament concepts uh, uh, to New Testament or current modern concepts. It's, it's not always the most accurate thing, but they figured that he was probably around eight foot or more tall. Now, on the Isra Israel side, uh, there's another commanding presence. His name is Saul, and while he's not technically a giant, he is clearly the tallest person in Israel. The Bible describes him as being head and shoulders above all the other people. And when we look at this, we start noticing the details of the story, the historical facts. And this is where we can get into trouble a little bit because we can start treating the details of a story and the facts of the story a lot like the things that we had to learn in school for history or for um, maybe math. Uh, how, many, how many remember learning your times tables? How many is old enough that you used index cards? Now, I'm pretty sure they use smart devices, but, you know, we, we had to learn them all. And five times five, once you learn it, it's just always true. Five times five is 25, so you learned your times tables. Learning the stories of Scripture are a little bit different than that. Uh, stories, when we learn them, over time we actually grow in our understanding of them, and they grow in their capacity to influence us. They keep yielding new insights. So there's a lot more to our world than just the titles people carry or shapes and colors. There are things that seem invisible to us and hard to grasp, things like meaning and purpose, good and evil. And these invisible things can be um, addressed and dealt with in the form of stories like this. And by the way, if in case you're wondering if I believe this story is true, I actually I do believe this story is true. I, I believe a, a, a young man by the name of David faced a, a, a giant named Goliath in the, in the Valley of Elah, and he won an incredible battle that day. Now, maybe you're sitting here going, well, that's all well and good, but I'm not really a story person. Uh, our culture is saturated in story. First, let's just start with movies. That's just illustrated stories. Then we can go to music. That's often a story with a melody line attached to it. And by the way, every single person in this room is a story writer and you write stories all the time. You just don't write them down. We call these fear. These stories that we write where we allow our imagination to go to try to figure out what might happen next and how it could hurt us. And in these stories, we are the main characters and we imagine unbelievable epic outcomes. And those imaginations actually control our decisions. We act in accordance with them. Our very real actions are determined. So this is why I want you to see this more, and there's a concept I want you to grasp, and that is that the desire to eliminate fear can be more of a temptation than a worthy goal. We think that it would be great if we had no fear. Are you sure that's true? Shouldn't there be some things you have a healthy fear of? 
and we just we want to eliminate all fear. I think often, well, let's say it this way, the oldest temptation in all of humanity is the temptation to either be like God or to be God. And here's the thing that's true about God. God knows all things, and God can do anything, which is why he doesn't worry about anything. God doesn't fear. And what we really want is to know everything there is to know and to control everything that needs to be controlled so that we won't be afraid. And what we're really after is that kind of power, that kind of knowledge that really we should see as a temptation rather than learning to trust someone who has that kind of knowledge and that kind of power. It's astonishing how many people consider faith as a way to eliminate fear rather than to encourage risk. A lot of people think that the reason we gather in rooms like this is so that we can feel safer. And the truth is, is we gather in rooms like this so that we can feel braver. Our world is a very risky place. It's a very dangerous place. And when people are paralyzed by their fears, we don't accomplish what God intends to be done in our world. And so if you are a person who struggles with fear and you were hoping I could reduce your anxiety today, you're probably going to be even more anxious. I'm not here to reduce your anxiety. I'm here to increase your bravery. That's what makes the difference. Because our actions are determined by our imaginations. We, we tell ourselves a story. We make one up. And well, it's, I can see this happening. Of course you can. That's the point. That's why it has such power to control us. What's interesting about David is the story that David imagined was saturated in the presence of God rather than controlled by the presence of a giant. And that's why the story that he sees looks way different than the story everybody else sees. All they can see is a giant grounding them into the dust of the earth. And David sees a completely different outcome. And it's not as though he can't see the giant. It's hard to ignore a giant, much less a big angry giant who is trash talking and wielding a 25 pound spear like it's a baton of a cheerleader and plated with armor. These guys you can't miss. But giants don't actually get bigger in our world. We just feel like we keep getting smaller. And that's what was happening to King Saul and all of the soldiers in the Israeli army. This brutal and cruel giant had become the center of their lives. Everything they talked about all day was around that. Every, all of their actions, how they positioned themselves, whether they were awake or asleep or what they ate was all being determined by the presence of this brutal and cruel giant in their lives. And what's interesting is that the same imaginations that makes giants important also has a way of making people around us insignificant. David goes to see his brothers. He's not there because he's in the army. He's too young to serve in the army. And the only reason he's there is because his father has sent a care package. And so he's bringing them some of the foodstuffs from back home so that they'll feel a little bit more comfortable in a very dangerous situation. And when David gets there, his brothers are suspicious of him. They're demeaning to him. They have nothing to say that's nice to say about him. Why? Because their entire imagination is dominated by a giant. And when all you can see is the giant, what you see in everybody else is always suspicious. This happens in our world all the time. And we have to learn how we can have our imaginations saturated with the presence of God as, as opposed to other things. So when our imagination is dominated by something evil, we lose our ability to see what is good and true. So David's imagination is dominated by God. Once you see God, it puts lesser giants in their place. Now, it wasn't like David had never experienced anything dangerous in his life. He had. As a shepherd, he had had to face lions and bears. And uh, when those animals, those predators would attack he would respond. But what's interesting is that in his conversation with Saul about his ability to be victorious, he doesn't claim it was because he had a special skill or a special strategy. He claimed it was because God was with him. And the same God that helped him with lions and bears would help him with this giant. David is so saturated himself in God's presence that God's word actually seems more real to him than the roars of lions, bears, or of giants. So how, how did he do that? 
How, how do you allow your imagination to be saturated by God like that? And, and there's a number of things that David did. For, for one, he prayed. Prayer is just a conversation with God. His life was a lot of isolation with a bunch of sheep. Uh, I don't know what kind of conversation you can have with a sheep, but I'm guessing it's not very enjoyable. And, and so you can only talk to the sheep for so long, and you can only talk to yourself for so long. I've heard some people tell me it's the smartest conversation they've had all day. And that might be true, but you can only say so much to yourself. David learned to direct his conversation to God. And he sang songs that talked about those attributes of God. We would call that worship. He wasn't doing it for an audience. He wasn't doing it for attention. He was doing it because he's out in the middle of nowhere, and the more he thinks about God, something rises in him to give praise to God. And he meditates on things. That just means he, he asks some follow-up questions to a thought he's exposed to. So if God really is that powerful, then what? If God really is that loving, then what? If God really is that caring, then what? And so he meditates. And all of these practices begins to shape his imagination. And so he sees things differently. And he sees different things. So he was a little confused as to why everyone else could only see a giant that day. Now, David had never been in this valley before. David had never seen a giant before. It's not like he had a special set of skills and strategies for handling giants. He didn't go to Saul and say, I happen to, I happen to have a lot of information on giants. And as it turns out, they're a little susceptible if you come to them from the left side. There's nothing like that. He hasn't any of those skills or strategies. In fact, he looks weak. He looked weak to Saul. He looked weak to his brothers. He looked weak to Goliath. Goliath is offended that they would send a boy out. That's how he refers to him. A boy out to fight him. And it's very easy to read this story and say, well, David won in spite of his weakness. But the truth is, David won because of his weakness. He didn't think that he had any special skills or strategies. He didn't think that he could best a giant. But he knew that God could. And even Goliath overlooked this guy. Goliath didn't prepare himself like he should have because he thought this guy was too weak for him. How many are glad that God doesn't just bring victory into our life in spite of our weakness, but often because of our weakness? The Apostle Paul would say it this way. He said, I've learned to actually rejoice in my weakness because when I am weak, that's when I experience some of the greatest strength God has to offer. It's just absolutely astonishing. So King Saul is extremely anxious. And so what he tries to do is outfit David for this fight. Now that he's signed off on it, so he puts his armor on him, his helmet, gives him his sword, and David tries to walk around with it and he just can't use it. It's interesting that once you decide you're going to take an, a step that feels like a step of faith or has a little bit of risk into it, how many people will surround you and start piling on advice and start piling on their wisdom and start piling on their instructions. And this is what I would say. If all of this stuff was so good at fighting giants, why isn't Goliath already dead? It didn't do anything for Saul. It didn't do anything for anybody else. And I have such... Uh, incredible respect for what David does. David goes to Saul and says, I'm sorry, I can't use this. It's a very hard thing to decline a gift from someone you respect. But David has figured it out. You can't defeat giants with borrowed armor. You have to be authentic to who you really are. And so he says he can't use this. And he chooses to live from a God-dominated imagination rather than a giant-dominated imagination. Now, Israel is at risk here because the way the battle was set up is this isn't just two guys going after each other. That's just entertainment. But one is going to win and one is going to lose. And whoever the loser is, their entire nation loses. And they're going to become the slaves of the other nation. So the nation of Israel is actually at risk of extinction. Someone's going to die today, but whoever side they have their champion die, well, 
and everybody else is going to be enslaved. They're going to lose their identity. They're no longer going to be the people of God. They're going to be the slaves of Philistine. And so we have on one side a bullying giant and on the other side an anxious king and no one seems to notice that there's a third option in the story. And it's this young man who's bowing or kneeling at a brook. And no one knows that what he's doing is the most important thing that's happening that day. Until David shows up, there's only two options, brute force or paralyzing fear. By the way, those are the two options our world offers us too. But David finds a third option. And he selects his stones and then suddenly he's running, which is not surprising. Any of us would have run in that situation. It's the direction he's running. It surprised everybody. No one can believe what they're seeing. Saul can't believe it. His brothers can't believe it. The people and the, the soldiers in the army of Israel can't believe it. Goliath can't believe it. He's running toward the battle line. He reaches into his little uh, sack. He pulls out a stone. He puts it in the sling. He gives it a couple of swings and he lets the thing go and it flies straight into the forehead of the giant and the giant, Goliath, collapses to the ground face first. Without ever drawing a sword, this trash-talking giant is defeated. And here's what I want you to know. This is not just an inspiring story. This affects us in our life, too. In our world, we think, well, there's that idea that a champion would go out and battle for us and that our lives would be controlled by the outcome. That, that doesn't happen in our world anymore. When you think about it, it's a pretty efficient way. Instead of tens of thousands dying, only one would die for many. Does that sound familiar to you? Because there was a champion for us. And one died for the many. Even in our own world, in our culture, there's a system like this where one person advocates for another. If you've ever been uh, charged with a crime, like parking too long somewhere or driving too fast somewhere or robbing a bank, <laughs> if you're here, we're glad you, you're not in jail. <laughs> but your entire outcome depends on the skill of the person who will advocate for you in the courtroom. He's the one who stands before the judge, and if he's really good at his job, you're going to get to walk free. And if he's not good at his job, you could go to jail. And we have in Christ the one who is our champion. And David was willing to risk his life for others. Jesus actually gives his life for others. And the outcome of his battle against the giants that we could never defeat changes everything for us. So we have one person, Jesus, who has won that battle for us. Now, it's not a reasonable goal, I don't think, to eliminate fear in your life. I, I don't think you can actually do it. Uh, you might be able to do it for a few minutes, but and I'm not even sure it's healthy to do that. I think it is a reasonable goal to try to get to a place where fear is not deciding for you what your responses or actions will be. I think that's a good goal. I think it's a reasonable goal to try to find ways to act in spite of your fear because courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is the ability to act even when you are afraid. So the goal is not to reduce anxiety. The goal is to become braver in the face of it. That's the goal this morning. So how does this work? Well, the Apostle Paul would write a letter to a young man who was a Christian leader and he, like David, was very young, and people had difficulty respecting him because of his youth. And this is what, and he was very anxious about leading. And this is what Paul writes to him. He says, the spirit that God gave us does not make us, what's the next word, timid? That the anxiety and the fear that we are experiencing, this is not something that God imposes on us. But he does give us something else. 
He gives us power, which is really ability and energy, the capacity to do a thing and the energy to do a thing. He, he gives you love because it's absolutely astonishing. When you love, love will override your fear. I've seen people do incredibly heroic things, not because they felt brave, but because they loved so much. And, and he says, and, and, and self-discipline, a way to, to navigate your life where you are deciding rather than just reflecting or responding or reacting to all the things that are around you. So the question becomes this. It's really interesting. So, so then what frees you to be able to act? Because we all know what it's like to be scared and paralyzed, to be unwilling to make a decision, to, to go into pause mode or withdraw mode. We all know what that's like. And, and the best illustration, as always, comes in the life of Jesus because we find him in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's praying these gut-wrenching prayers. We're, we're almost unprepared for his honesty in his conversation with his father. And he just says, you know, if there's any other way, because he knows what's coming. He knows how hard this is going to be, how painful this is going to be. He knows. Is there any other way? And, and he says, but but not my will, what your will is. So is he just being fearless in that moment? And I don't think that's what's happening. We actually have a clue that's given to us in Hebrews, the 12th chapter, the second verse. It gives us an insight into what was going on in Jesus right at that moment. And this is what it tells us. Fix your eyes. Look unto Jesus, who's the author and the perfecter of our faith. Listen to this next part who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross and despised its shame. Now, think about this. When Jesus is facing the cross in all of its pain and agony, when he knows what's going to happen, his imagination is not dominated by crosses or nails or hammers or soldiers or betrayers. His imagination is dominated by his father. And he sees that there's a day when there will be a multitude, a sea of humanity who are part of God's family forever as a result of this action. And he said when he could see the benefit for eternity, it brought such hope and joy to him that he looked back at the cross and this is what he thought about that. I know it's going to be horrible, but it won't last forever. The joy will. I know it is shameful, but the shame won't last forever. The joy will. And he found the ability to act because his imagination allowed him to see a different outcome. That's the difference for Jesus, and that can be the difference for you. Let's bow our heads this morning. Sometimes I think we come into rooms like this, and because we struggle with anxiety and fear, we assume that it it doesn't work or it doesn't work for us. <coughs> Somehow we're getting it wrong. And I don't think that's true. We're going to have anxious moments. We're going to have anxious thoughts. And rather than the Bible telling us that should never happen, the Bible tells us what to do when it happens. We can convert those thoughts to prayer. We, we can engage in community where we're surrounded by people who will support us. There's all kinds of options available to us who struggle with fear and anxiety. That your fear does not mean God isn't real. And your fear does not mean that God doesn't love you. And your fear does not mean that you are not his child. So Heavenly Father, I ask that you would help us today because we do have anxious thoughts and it does control our decisions and it does paralyze us and cause us to withdraw from some of the very best gifts you've brought into our lives. Would you help us today to see you more clearly so it puts all these other things in perspective? In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together this morning.